Welcome. In this session, we are going to talk about the principles of management of eyelid injuries. For proper management of an eyelid injury, we have to find out about the nature of causation of the injury. Because a high-speed projectile injury can have a retained intraocular or intraorbital foreign body. Bite injuries, whether from animals or humans, are likely to be infected and should be treated accordingly. And we have to rule out the possibility of a non-accidental trauma which can occur particularly in children and elderly patients because of its medical legal implications. We also need to know the time passed after the event. A polytrauma patient needs to be stabilized before we do a periorbital examination and injuries to look for in the periorbital region are injuries to the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, injury to the eyelid margins and the canthal tendons. They are very important to identify as we will be discussing further. Injury to blood vessels and nerves, injury to the body orbit for which a CT scan should be done, which also detects a foreign body if present. And we must exclude an injury to the globe and if present, repair of the globe injury takes precedence over the repair of the periorbital injury. A photographic documentation of the injury is important for medical legal reasons. Objectives of management of a periocular injury is primarily protection of the globe, in addition to which restoration of function of the injured tissue and improving cosmesis for the patient are also important. Initial management of periocular injury includes protection of the exposed cornea and prophylaxis for infection with irrigation of the contaminated wound removal of easily accessible foreign bodies, systemic antibiotics, tetanus prophylaxis, and rabies immunization for bite injuries. Pediatric patients and those with bony and extensive soft tissue injuries require general anesthesia for repair of the injury, but most other injuries can be repaired under local anesthesia. The types of eyelid injuries we are going to discuss are penetrating injuries, bite injuries, and burn injuries. Penetrating injuries or lacerations not involving the eyelid margin and limited to the skin and orbicularis needs only skin sutures. Scarring following repair can be minimized with minimal debridement of the injured area, use of small caliber suture material, everting the wound edges being sutured, and early suture removal within 6 to 7 days of repair of the wound. In most cases, orbicularis does not require a separate closure which may actually cause distortion of the normal anatomy. Absorbable sutures are preferable for children and patients with uncertain follow-up. Very superficial lacerations need not be sutured, particularly if suturing causes distortion of the normal anatomy. Lacerations violating the orbital septum presents with orbital fat prolapse. The fat in the pre-aponeurotic space prolapses through the violated orbital septum. Here the wound should be irrigated and any foreign body should be removed. The levator palpebris superioris muscle and its aponeurosis should be checked for any injury and can be repaired by attaching to the eyelid. However, the orbital septum should not be included in the suture to avoid severe eyelid retraction which can result in cicatricial lagophthalmos and this is very important to remember. However, instead of repair of the LPS injury during the primary repair, secondary repair of the LPS injury in a subsequent session is often preferred. Tarsal laceration needs to be sutured and the lacerated edges of the tarsus should be conservatively trimmed to obtain squared off edges for a good cosmetic result. Orbital septum should not be reattached to the tarsus to avoid eyelid retraction and cicatricial lack of thalamus. And as mentioned, this is very important to remember. The preaponeurotic orbital fat should be gently repositioned posterior to the septum followed by skin closure. Injuries with tissue loss requires reconstructive eyelid surgery which we will be discussing in the next session. Lacerations involving the eyelid margin requires precise suturing to avoid notching of the eyelid margin. For precise apposition of the lacerated lid margins, three sutures are required as shown by the red lines in this diagram. The first suture passes through the lash line along the plane of the skin 
The second suture passes through the gray line along the plane of the orbicularis oculi muscle. The third suture passes through the level of the meibomian gland openings along the plane of the tarsus. After the lid margins are approximated, the vertical extent of the laceration is then approximated with partial thickness sutures as shown by the blue lines in this diagram. These partial thickness sutures should not penetrate the palpebral conjunctiva or else they will be causing irritation of the ocular surface. These partial thickness sutures take the skin orbicular rich tissue and the tarsal tissue together in one pass. The skin is then sutured separately as shown by the green lines in this diagram. All wound margins, whether of the marginal sutures, the partial thickness skin orbicularis to tarsus sutures or the skin sutures should be moderately everted to avoid guttering. Suture ends should be oriented away from the ocular surface so that they do not irritate the ocular surface. The ends of the margin sutures are kept long and are held away from the ocular surface by engaging them within the knots of the skin sutures. Alternatively, a margin involving eyelid laceration can be repaired with only three vertical mattress sutures with buried knots. Canthal lacerations are important to identify and repair because lateral and medial canthal tendons support the upper and the lower eyelid. Canthal lacerations occurs from horizontal tractional injury to the eyelids tearing the lids at their weakest points, the insertions of the lateral canthal tendon and the medial canthal tendon. And it is diagnosed by pulling the eyelid in the opposite direction while palpating the insertion of the tendon suspected to have been injured. Laceration of the medial canthal tendon is suggested by telecanthus, rounding of the medial canthus and an inability of the upper and lower lids to completely cover the medial aspect of the globe. In MCT laceration, associated lacrimal injury needs to be excluded and if present, it should be repaired as will be described in a subsequent session. If only the posterior limb of the MCT is disinserted, it is critical to insert it back to the posterior lacrimal crest. If only the superior and the inferior limbs are disinserted, they can be inserted back to the anterior lacrimal crest. But if all three limbs are injured, the avulse tendon is attached to the posterior lacrimal crest. So inserting the posterior limb of the MCT to the posterior lacrimal crest is critical. However, if there is a fracture of the medial orbital wall, the tendon is sutured to the metal plate used to repair the fracture. Avulsion of the lateral canthal tendon is similarly reattached back to the lateral orbital tubercle. Traumatic ptosis should be observed for 3 to 6 months before correction, but children may require earlier repair to avoid amblyopia. Bite injuries, whether from animals or humans, can cause eyelid laceration, canthal tendon avulsions, and canalicular injuries. Intraocular injuries are uncommon in bite wounds but can occur in children, and treatment of bite injuries include irrigation, tetanus and rabies vaccination. Systemic antibiotics, particularly for Pastorella maltocida, which is the most common organism in infected dog and cat bites, is potentially invasive but responds well to penicillin therapy. Early repair of a bite wound is recommended. Burn injuries can be thermal or chemical and requires corneal protection early on because most of these patients are either heavily sedated or unconscious. Later, significant cicatrization develops and cicatrization is the most important sequelae of burn injuries to the eyelid. And cicatrization leads to ectropion, lid retraction, lag of thalmos and corneal exposure. And this sequelae require extensive or complete tarsography, often more than is apparently required because effect of cicatrization of eyelid burns is often progressive for the initial few months. Correction of the cicatricial defects are usually delayed till cicatrization is complete, but may be required early on in corneal exposure. The surgical anterior lamella of the eyelids representing the skin orbicularis layer is the most affected in burn injuries and requires skin grafts or skin muscle flaps for repair. And the surgical posterior lamella representing the tarsus and the conjunctiva can be involved in severe burns 
and require mucous membrane grafting. Secondary repair of eyelid injuries are required for delay in the primary repair or for removing scars and repairing defects following the primary repair and we will be discussing these techniques in more detail in the next session. Skin scars aligned along relaxed skin tension lines can be removed using elliptical incisions and skin scars not oriented along relaxed skin tension lines require gel plastic techniques for removal. Anterior lamellar tissue loss or shortening requires skin grafts either free or with muscle flaps and the skin used should be hairless, supple, similar in color and thickness to the eyelid skin with minimal actinic damage. In the posterior lamella, if the conjunctiva is only damaged, a buccal mucous membrane may suffice. But when there is conjunctival as well as tarsal defects, tarsoconjunctival flap developed from the lower lid will be required for upper lid defects. And for lower lid injuries, hard pellet grafts can be used, but hard pellet grafts should not be used for the upper lid because the rough consistency of the surface of the hard pellet graft may injure the ocular surface. Cicatricial changes developing following primary repair may also need revision. And these include lid margin notching which requires excision of the notched area of the lid margin and closure of the defect. Lid retraction which requires removing the scar tissue causing the lid retraction and tightening of the medial and the lateral canthal tendons and LPS scarring leading to lag of thalmos which requires complex surgical procedures. Thank you for listening.